Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. Derek, thank you for uh, joining uh, the podcast. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. As a way of starting uh, this, maybe you can introduce yourself and your career so far. Yeah, so I'm the, I'm the CFO of the Chief Digital Information Office uh, here in UBS. Um, I've, I've kind of, um, I've worked in financial services for over 20 years with Barclays and UBS. Um, my background is, is, I'm a chartered accountant by profession, but I've always been leaning towards technology. Um, I, I implemented SAP when I was younger uh, a, 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 you know, across Europe. I'd always been interested in implementing programs and projects and um, always interested in change. So it's a natural kind of flow for me to be involved in helping to drive technological changes within, within banks. So that's where, I, um, that's where my passion is. Um, and I have a master's in uh, information systems management and a doctorate in information systems management from, uh, from Warwick. And um, yeah, so it's no wonder it's that kind of cross between uh, finance and and technology. And and I, I work as a business partner, advising the firm on um, what we should do on the financials around technology and how yeah the investment and uh, making sure that that's controlled right and we're investing in, in the right spaces and making sure that we get the most out of our financials. Um, as I say, twenty years. With Barclays and UBS around the globe, both in Singapore and now I'm based in uh, in Zurich. Wow, fantastic! I mean, that <laughs> that sounds like a great career so far, and I'm sure there's there's a lot more ahead of you. I know I know you're a big fan of disruption theory, and I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on how disruption impacts financial services. So I, I appreciate that. For example, banks are quite cumbersome in relation to, you know, the complexity of services, the structure, the, 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 the legacy processes and systems that they have, mm. certainly in comparison with some of the, the new startups and, and more recently uh, big tech, right? There's a, there's a lot of inertia in, in, in banks. Mm. But then again, these incumbent banks are um, more resourceful uh, than fintech startups and, and could, in theory, right, make investments that could outcompete um, um, those startups. So, hmm. so perhaps uh, spending um, some time to differentiate um, between how these, um, you know, incumbents and the new entrants in the space um, face disruption. Sure. Um, maybe that, that that that's a good starting point for our discussion. Yeah, I think it, I think this is the kind of the kind of core topic, really, because. Well, this is my doctorate thesis. Uh, in effect, is looking. If you go back six, seven years, um, the banking industry had just come out of the financial crisis. It was still dealing with a lot of regulatory issues. And also com competition was very high. Um, returns were, were uh, subdued. And out of, out of technological changes came um, these new fintechs and big techs. Um, we're also uh, investing and playing into financial services. And, and, the, and the rhetoric and the overhype at the time was, well, they're going to destroy banks. Um, there's that old saying, I think it was from Bill Gates, you know, we don't need banking, we need banking services. And, but we don't need banks necessarily. And, and the thinking, and there was a lot, of, a lot of discussion at the time, was how much is the new fintechs and big techs going to disrupt banks? And so my, my whole thesis, I was in, in, interested in disruption theory anyway. You know, so why do some companies succeed? Why do some companies fail? Um, why do some industries um, you know, change quicker than others? And applying that disruption theory to financial services is exactly what I, what I did over a five-year period. And what I came up with was there was kind of internal and external forces for change and internal and external barriers to change. And so looking at um, 
in the context of financial services, but what were those external forces? So some of the things we just mentioned, some of the things of um, new venture capital, huge amounts of investment were coming in to set up some new firms. Um, digital banks became live, the revolutes of this world. Big tech started to play into this space. There was a huge swathe of investment, which is a good sign for you know, disruptions coming. Technological change was enabling that. So, you know, people could set up fintechs quite quickly um, without huge amounts of investment because of cloud technology, for example, that you could turn on and off. Yeah, um, all, the, all the requirements of a data center pretty quickly at a pretty low cost. Things like consumer patterns were changing. People were using their phones more. Uh, people wanted to have that experience, which is more online. So there was a lot of forces for change externally around, especially around um, the technological changes um, and also the, the new players coming into the market. So immediately you would think, well, the industry is going to get disrupted. Uh, you know, we're going to see massive sways of, of, of work going to these fintechs, but, it, but it's far more complex than that. So what I also looked into is, well, what are those barriers to stopping the industry just being disrupted? Um, you know, obviously things like blockchain was the big discussion at the time, brand new technologies like um, yeah, you know, Bitcoin, uh, et cetera, which could disintermediate the banking industry. So all of those things were happening as external factors, but there's external things stopping it as well. So things like regulation, um, Regulation is kind of a double-edged sword for um, for financial services. It helps, it, you know, it costs a huge amount to to be highly regulated, um, but also um, new incumbents coming into that space are also faced with huge swathes of, of 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 regulation, and we'll probably see a lot more regulation in the in the um, you know virtual assets uh, space following. Uh, following you know, what happened last year with FTX. So, so there's barriers like regulation, um, stopping people coming in, technical know-how. Banking isn't just about payments. Everyone talks about payments or, or, or simple payment, but the swathes of technical knowledge to do some of the work that we do, whether it's on the investment banking side or advisory side, um, looking after wealth management, um, you know, the, the knowledge, the embedded knowledge it is not something that's easy, easily cop, uh, copied. Um, also on the barrier side is trust, simple as that. It's, it's amazing how people stay with banks for a very long time, even when the service isn't very good. There's a lot of research in, that I, I looked into was, you know, the service has to be pretty bad for people to move banks. Um, but, they, but the trust gets even more nuanced when it becomes more complex products. So, or the value to an individual becomes higher. So, you know, you could trust someone with a payment, but would you trust them with your life savings if it's a digital brand new fintech? So it's new nuance. So there was external things that were forcing change on the on uh, the industry, and that and that's continuing. And then, but there's also barriers, external barriers, which are slowing it down, stopping it. You know, are people ready? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the external stuff. And then I looked at the internal things. So there's internal barriers for change. Things, things that you've said around, you know, banks are quite complex. Uh, we have many, many products. We have technical debt. Um, we have a lot of fixed costs. Um, in some cases, there was a lack of knowledge at the, at the senior levels on technological changes. The culture, it, you know, Banking is quite hub hubris, really. It's been been around for 200, 300 years. Some of the banks, have, you know, like Barclays, was a 300 year plus uh, company. Um, you know, is it really going to get disrupted? It's been around a long time. So there's a lot of barriers internally to change, um, but there's a lot of things that they are doing to change. So moving to agile ways of working, um, investing in fintechs themselves. Um, taking over some fintechs in some cases, um, bringing in new ways of working, simplifying their, their architecture around modular design, um, design architectures, um, and in some cases, partnering 
with, with other fintechs. So if you think about the four things that I looked at was external forces, external barriers, internal barriers, and then internal ways that companies work. My conclusion is that things are going to be a lot slower and it, and it, it depends on very much on the product as to how quickly things will get disrupted or not. Okay. Well, you touched on so many different uh, things, and and maybe maybe we need to lead uh, to, to to take a step back and 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 take a deep dive mm. maybe on some of these uh, points. So, mm -hmm. um, in particular, you know, I want to focus on obviously all the things that you mentioned. You know, the external barriers, including um, disruption from financial crisis, regulatory interventions. I think the PS um, D two in Europe mm -hmm. has definitely opened up. Um, innovation and has disrupted the way banks are doing um, uh, their business. But just a couple of points, mm -hmm. right? So first, where are incumbents in the financial sector mostly disrupted? In other words, what or which types of services are most attractive mm -hmm. for the new entrants? And, and, and why is that so? So that, that's the first point, right? Um, and then the second point is, you know, how are those new entrants entering mm. these markets? You know, with, with what kind of technology, with what kind of business models? Um, so these are, these are maybe, maybe we dig deeper into these two points. So sure. types of services that get disrupted yeah. and, and, and then how they are getting disrupted and by whom. Yeah, so in my research, there was, um, it seemed to be quite logical. I think firms have gone about attacking financial services in a very business way. And it, it, it and, and in the research that I did, it seemed to be that they are looking at where the biggest revenue pools are with the biggest return, with the lowest possible barriers uh, to, to that. Um, now that sounds a, a, an obvious point, right? So payments is the classic wow. example. You know, the technological, um, the technologies in place um, to, to disrupt payments, um, the, the revenue pools are quite high and the regulatory requirements and the technical expertise is quite low. If you take the opposite to that, uh, let's take um, someone who's advising um, millionaires on their wealth planning. This is very bespoke. It's very um, high levels of trust, high levels of regulation. Uh, you have to be pretty regulated if you're going to look after someone's someone's wealth, um, and and the and the the knowledge is pretty much embedded in, into these organisations. So, you know, I think it's where the biggest return is, biggest pools, the lowest barriers, and where the technology can can or can automate or, or 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 disrupt into those into those areas. So you see a lot of you know people start off with at the product layer and build up those products which are relatively simple maybe not as advanced, um, mm -hmm. which, which often uh, can be, um, can start off better actually. Let's take Revolut as an example, cards allowing you to do FX around the world at a very low cost at spot um, versus, versus what the banking uh, offering is. It's a really simple technology to do. Uh, it's more around business model. It can be automated. Um, a new company, um, you know, bank can come in and do that. It's relatively low on the regulation, as long as you've got a banking license. Um, the knowledge to do it is relatively low. Um, and that's where they're attacking. And that's where they built up products. And then they'll start, and, and what we've seen is they'll start building up on those products once the, once uh, customers are comfortable uh, with, with that, uh, uh, that provider. Okay. And also you mentioned that regulation can come in hmm. and open up doors um, once that trust level is achieved, right? Hmm. Once there's enough scale, a regulation can come in and potentially, you know, disrupt this, even, even the, the services that were previously very difficult to enter by these incumbents, uh, by these new entrants, right? And hmm. so, so that, that's one point. And the other point is, I understand some banks have entered into partnerships with these fintechs as yeah. a way of catching up, um, mm. but also as a way of getting away from some of their legacy 
uh, systems and legacy business models, right? So, so Absolutely. both of these both of these disruptive forces are in play, right? And again, mm. it would be great to differentiate when one is happening and when the other uh, is 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 more prevalent or or, or more feasible um, for some of these fintechs. Yeah. So, so let's say regulation, as, as I mentioned, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think. I think on one hand, um, it's a huge um, burden on banks to 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 do all the regulation. Um, but coming out of the financial crisis, it was necessary uh, to to put those controls in place. But those same burden and 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 um, and it's very costly is also a barrier for people uh, joining joining in. On the other hand. The reg regulation of certain um, countries or, or uh, domains has meant that things like digital licenses have been handed out to en enable digital banks to, to enter into the market. Um, or you mentioned PSD2, you know, open banking, you know, who owns the, the data uh, associated to, to, to a customer. If banks hold it, held it themselves and owned it, or is it the customer who owns it and you can aggregate your banking, uh, um, different uh, uh, banking products, you know, in, in one open banking system. So regulation is allowing um, banks, digital banks to open up, you know, maybe like Singapore opened up a number of digital banks, or whether it is allowing um, more experimental work to do with digital currencies, like here in Switzerland. It's very open to to uh, you know experimenting with those type of things. Uh, it's open up on that on that type of regulation, um, or whether it's things more more at a European level around uh, around open banking. All of those things can disrupt um, the, the 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 banking system. But but ultimately, for me, the question is: it still comes back to those fundamentals of um, around trust um, as well with the customer. Um, and and what products do you trust uh, digital players with? I might trust a digital player with doing spot rates when I when I travel to Asia. I might not trust a digital player with my life savings or my pension. Uh, so it's what do you what do they trust and what do they not trust? Because um, yeah, yeah, but absolutely, regulation is a double edged sword. It's in, enabling some openings. At the same time, it is a huge burden on firms as well. Okay. On the partnering side, on the partnering side, yeah. absolutely. Um, the fintechs are, on one hand, uh, competition, or was, was originally seen to be competition. On the other hand, they are a huge source of innovation for, for, for banks. Um, and partnering up with them, the way that they work and the, and the, and the speed that they're coming up with products, 100%, all banks are, we are, most banks are. Um, and we see that, that, that it can be plug and play. Often they are aimed as a niche product or, as, or a, a niche service, which can absolutely be brought into a bank and complement it. Uh, complement it. Um, and it can often add to the wealth of services that we have in a better way than we would be able to develop our, ourselves or certainly at the speed that, that we do. Um, you know, we see that maybe just a simple example in maybe in the small, medium, enterprise area where there could be a niche product for that particular area uh, instead of developing ourselves we, we can work with a with a fintech who's already developed it uh, a, a particular product um, in some cases you know banks have taken over um, uh, fintechs and and uh, but then it comes on to you know how do you integrate uh, in, in the right way so yes you know does that kind of in some cases fintechs are providing uh, some competition which I think is good, I think, for incumbents because it um, enables us to raise the bar. In some cases, it enables us to partner with them and, um, and, and take those services in as well. So it's a bit of both. Okay. And it's an interesting partnership, right? I mean, this is, this is not just outsourcing services like you yeah. would find in, in other places. As you said, it's, it, I guess it's sort of, um, greenfield investment in a way, right? Mm. Uh, because it could happen entirely outside of uh, existing banking uh, business processes and systems, etc. It could be completely mm. outside of the bank, but mm. 
in partnership with the bank, right? So it could yeah. be seen as a greenfield type of investment. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, as you said, what's interesting is the bank acts as a venture capitalist <laughs> in the mm. sense that I am funding you, I am mm. benefiting from this. And if I see that there is enough scale, I'll buy you, I'll, I'll you know, I'll acquire you, right? And, I, mm. and then I'll do whatever I want. And, and perhaps can you give maybe a couple of examples of, you know, such partnerships, maybe a real examples of how this um, has taken off over the years and, and some of the outcomes, you know, both successful or unsuccessful, if, if you have those examples. Yeah, so, so, so we do. I, I, I'm not going into specifics, but I'll try and give, give a, a, an okay. example of one. It tends to be a product. Um, and it tends to be a product that we're interested in. And often we do two things. One is we often buy the services off that fintech. Um, but that's just a purchasing relationship to buy that service. But we also take a stock, uh, um, a, a purchase a, a share in that, in that um, uh, fintech as well. And what that enables us to do is work far more closely with the board and, 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 the, and the actual company to, to shape what it's doing. So, and it's a kind of a, a symbiotic kind of relationship where we, they gain from our knowledge um, as, as much as we do of them um, because they're very interested in working with us. Let, to be honest, they're less interested in the money. They're, they're more interested in the knowledge that we can give them around our customers and how it would work and how we would integrate because they can then use that on with a lot, a lot more uh, customers. And we're less interested in the service per se, but also how they've developed it uh, and, and, and the ways of working that they, they implement. So is that kind of dual relationship, I think, that it's not just about purchasing a service because we can just do that. It's also about, um, you know, building that relationship beyond, beyond that. Um, so where we take a co-ownership into the firm and they they benefit from us, and we benefit from them. Uh, that that's happened multiple times uh, in 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 the organisation. Um, yeah, so yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, and and I'm sure this is true for most banks, right? Especially the ones that uh, you know the, the, they have a long history in traditional banking, and and they have no idea how, what to do with digital, right? Like I, I've seen some some statistics on, I guess Barclays and and Lloyd's and others that have partnered with this uh, new entrance to launch services. And I wonder how successful that has been and, and what has been the trajectory of those partnerships in relation to then the bank taking over and launching their own services or, um, you know, split, you know, the partnership being split up and then uh, the two firms take, uh, they're both, you know, they, they, they take different ways. Yeah, I haven't seen that many great example of that, right? Where a whole FinTech has been taken over and, and then that's been developed into something. I, I, don't, I, I, don't think, I don't think it works that well. I think, I think at a product layer, I think where you integrate a product in as a way of doing that product better than you could do internally, I think works very well. And I think there's tons of examples of that outside. But are there really great examples where uh, banks have, have either gone greenfield or or digital and, and broad company in and and then that that's kind of uh eaten up their existing um the, the existing set you know uh, cannibalized their existing product set and then moved over to do I, I don't know any um particularly so i i think it's more that it works well at the product layer um and i think and again, one of the things I looked into as a potential options for incumbents to tackle the changes was was fully go greenfield. I don't, I don't think that works either. Um, um, okay. I think. And why is that? Build, why is that? I think. I think. If you look at the customers that we have, uh, they they work with us. Uh, they they've been. I don't know about you, but I but I bank with UBS and and, and Barclays all my life, all my life. Um, <laughs> moving over to this. Like I do also use fintechs for certain services, um, like I mentioned Revolut on, on the credit card, but UBS has now you know, brought out an awesome product um, which completely combats it. So I've actually moved back onto UBS because it, it tackles all of my 
needs and it's not just one need it's all of my needs from pensions to to investments to to banking to now in credit cards to spot rates to easy access thing so i think i think bank and i think you mentioned around banks aren't very good at technology i i think they are um so one of the starting premise that that i had really seven years ago was you know we're too slow we've got too much legacy um people were going to eat us alive um what i found is actually we have the most awesome uh technologists um we're moving to more agile ways of working you know we've got twenty thousand people working in agile uh, at the moment and that's completely and, and the speed of development that we're doing is radically different than it was a few years ago um our product set is is far more aimed at meeting the customer's needs than it was and so in a lot of ways what fintech's also done not only provided competition provided um you know, innovation because as we partner but it's also really meant that we have to up our game <laughs> and the good thing about us is we have we have a lot of resources to do that um so i i think i think we have the technology the question is the can can we can we work quick enough and can we change quick enough um and it, it's it the, the question has been more around speed than the internal knowledge i think we have some of the best people um in, in the world right. and some of the things that we do one last question that i have in relation to how incumbents partner with um, the fintechs i hmm. uh, assume that one of the incentives for fintechs to partner with banks is the ability to enter multiple um, geographical markets, not just yeah. product markets, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But, but what's the incentive for the banks and, and, and how does it work? Yeah, I think, I think it's le less of that and you're right. So fintechs often start off in a product in a geographical uh, location, uh, whether, it's, whether it's in Europe or a particular country uh, or America or whatever. And and in some cases it's not scalable because of the regulatory um, the regulatory differences um, across the different geographical space. And partnering with some of the banks, which are particularly global, uh, UBS has been a really global player. Um, we're in most, most countries. Is 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 obviously a massive uh, uh, incentive for for fintechs to do that. Um, from from our perspective, we have customers who go across the piece. So getting a product that is fit for purpose across the difficult geographical lo locations is also beneficial for us as well. Um, okay. So so it does work. It does work both ways. And, and they, you know, we want products that are scalable um, and around the globe, and, and so do they, obviously. Uh, so again, it works in both in both ways. But but assumingly, um, banks uh, dedicate more resources to this um, than the fintechs, right? Uh, and this this is where my question lied. And and you mentioned this idea of knowledge exchange and, and knowledge innovation, mm -hmm. but it's it sounds like in this case, uh, it's the fintechs that are, <laughs> as you said, they're not so much interested in the money; they're interested in the knowledge uh, exchange yeah. and potentially gaining that um, from their end. Um, maturity in the banking space to potentially then acquire a license. Yeah, yeah, but 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 some some of them don't want to, right? So 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 some of them don't like the thoughts that they want to grow into a bank or thoughts that they want to be a competitor. Um, again, that was one of the thought processes that I had that every fintech wants to be a competitor and everyone fintech wants to grow into this mam mammoth regulated bank. They often don't. Um, they're happy about the product that they they can help banks with and they and they they're often in a niche stream that they're very very good at um and you know in for some of these some of these guys are incredibly successful at that so do they want to be heavily regulated with you know all the challenges that that comes with that um or are they are they happy to to work with banks and provide awesome products around around the globe so not not all of them want to grow into into huge great, great big banks heavily regulated and all the problems with that okay okay all right i i want to move on to big tech and and i i think you mentioned um um 
that you know big tech is entering this space, which is a different player altogether, right? So Apple, Google, Amazon in particular, all of them are offering payments. And, and, and also they're starting to get into loans now, right? It's not mm. just payments anymore. And I think what's different here, you mentioned customer loyalty and customer trust mm. and as, as mm. being the core, the core competency. And, 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 and it sounds like, you know, these, these big tech already have that trust. So, you know, people may not necessarily trust Google <laughs> and Apple mm. in how they're managing their data, but they trust the service. They trust that it's going to be seamless integration across devices and it's going to be seamless integration across apps that they have on their mobile phone, for example. And, mm. and that kind of trust in the technology and the mm. service provider, right, is potentially disrupting the core trust relationship that the banks have with their customers. And it goes back to how we look at banking as a whole. So people look at banking in it's the same thing, right? Um, it, you know, but it, but it is very different, whether it's investment banking advisory on a, on a, um, I don't know, a sell off of a, of a firm or purchasing companies or equity trading, um, you know, bonds, fixed rates, um, that side of the business or advising on your wealth options, tax, global affairs, um, cust custodian, um, or, or are we talking retail uh, deposits, yeah. uh, loans, etc.? So we, we tend to be talking all the time on payment, um, which is, as I say, it's a huge revenue pool. It tends to be low on barriers uh, of entry. It tends to be where you where companies can call themselves non banks because it's more of a payment service, um, and and you know it's highly adaptable to automated technologies. So absolutely, this is where companies have, have, have been kind of investing in uh, and then moving into loans. And some of these firms have trust, but also have huge amounts of swathes of data on their clients yeah. as well. So Amazon has got an example where it's, uh, you know, those small and medium enterprise loans, um, and they have a huge understanding of that, that customer and, a, and a, basically a, a working relationship with them for, for quite a long time. So, you know, having that data and the trust is is two things, as well as huge pockets in, in terms of being able to uh, to develop. So absolutely. But but the question for me is, you know, disruption in what? Um, and when you start thinking, well, the industry as a whole um, versus certain product um, components, you know, does, does, does Apple want to be regulated uh, in the SEC? Um, does it want to give mortgages out where if customers default, Apple take their homes from them? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that's a good, I, yeah. I'm not sure that's a good advert. Or if they trade on cryptocurrencies and people lose their life savings, um, what, do, what do they really want to be, in, be involved in? But you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that people stick with banks all their lives with, I'm fanatical about Apple, some or Samsung, some or other things, but yeah. I've got every product you can think of with Apple <laughs> using Apple earphones and Apple iPhone. Um, so they have the trust, they have the data, they have the know-how, they have the financial resources. Um, what do they want to do and what they don't want to do? Where they're really helping people, um, like purchasing through Apple Pay and then spreading the payment over a, a number of quarters, super helpful. Um, loaning on a on a mortgage and then and then taking a the house off someone maybe not so. Yeah. So okay. So two things, right? Retail for everyday customers, but then also small and small and medium sized businesses, right? Those are yeah. the two targets. Mm. And 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 I have you know there's a there's a case study that I use in some of my classes. Um, you you probably know them. You know, Intuit QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. over the years, you know, they started at, out as a software company providing, yeah. you know, the QuickBooks software to s small and medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they opened up to all sorts of other things, including microloans. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think now they are at the point of offering even up to 100,000, I think, if I'm not mistaken. 100,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot, right? And, mm -hmm. and yeah. so they are a type of fintech you could say, mm. 
um, yeah. because they are entering this space. And they why are they doing it? Because they they have the data from yeah. their QuickBooks financing uh, software. They have collected so much data about SMEs that they can now use that data to target specific loan products through partnerships with banks, but also their own, um, and serve these SMEs. This is interest. This is not a big tech, obviously, but mm. you could see how, for ex for example, some you know a company like Intuit could be acquired yeah. by Amazon, for example, yeah. or Google. Yeah. And then, yeah. in addition to the data that they have, they also have other types of data, uh, data that sits on the cloud and and it serves other purposes that again yeah. could fit into uh, these product or service propositions, right? And that's, I think, an interesting um, value proposition right there. Yeah, I, th I think the example we said on uh, Amazon is a similar thing. I think the data that they gather on the customers is really interesting. I think they have so much data and that working relationship where you have that, and you have the same in that example as well, uh, and in that case study, yeah, I, I read it, it is it is super interesting because they can tailor products and you know one of the challenges with banks and, and everything else is credit risk right so you've got to get that right or you can have very very sharp uh, default loans and that can be a massive a massive challenge but i think if you understand the customer through the data and you have that working relationship with them you, you should be able to really minimize that uh, that default rate and, and with the data that you have you can you can tailor that um, you could offer loans at the right time um, you know, if people have ups and downs in terms of their, um, you know, um, their, their, their receivables and their payments, you know, bridging those type of things could be could be you know, something that would be really interesting for an SME uh, company because uh, obviously cash flow is, is critical for it. And and I think Amazon and and uh, uh, you know these examples are types of fintechs that can erode what is or has been traditionally a banking service absolutely yeah. um, that's yeah. why my my dissertation is called the erosion of, <laughs> of, of banking because i don't think it's a everything all stops because i think i think there's places for for everything but but certainly one of the things we you know we, we talk is that erosion and it's that constant forces of change coming on what was traditionally just a banking services that that changes over time for sure um and, and and we see plenty of examples for that. Yeah, and I guess in relation to that, and in relation to retail, um, mm. you mentioned earlier NFTs and crypto assets um, mm. uh, and other cryptocurrencies. You mentioned ha that Switzerland, um, the regulation is uh, more accommodating for these types of investments. Perhaps not elsewhere. But my question to you is the following: so. Once again, you know, big tech like Amazon, like Apple, like Google will, are probably in a better position to handle those types of digital assets securely, right? They can offer the cloud services, the secure infrastructure that would handle those types of assets. And they could very easily partner with a bank or other fintech a party that offers those assets and and target specific types of customers that are interested in these types of of investment. So there's this, you know, ecosystem relationship between all these different parties. There's, you know, each one has a different role to play to manage the investment, to manage the security of the assets. But at the end of the day, it's probably the bank that uh, has the customer facing relationship. Uh, yeah. and, and, and it's the bank that's on the line, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so you yes, you're offering NFTs and all sorts of other things, but, uh, you're relying on a number of different actors to make this a reality. So mm. my question is really about, you know, handling, managing data, um, in a secure way while preserving, you know, privacy, confidentiality of, of personal customer data, et cetera. Um, and generating value um, for both your, your customer, but also your ecosystem partners. It's a long question. Yeah, so, Sorry, I, 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 yeah, I, I was going to say, there's a lot, lot, of just, lot of components. There's a lot of moving parts, so it wasn't very well articulated, but you get the point. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, no, I do. I, I, think, I think we need to 
for me, I divide the technology up a little bit, and then let's talk about the actors and the and the challenges yeah. to play. So, when we talk about crypto, everyone talks about Bitcoin, but I think the bigger bigger piece is the dis- digital uh, ledger, uh, the, the DLT, the digital ledger technology that underpins it. Um, I think that digital ledger technology, I think, um, is for me is is the interesting component of this and how that will get get used over time it you know the the, the idea that everyone can have a view of a set of assets uh, globally and you have a register of what those assets are and you have the same view of those assets as i have the same view of those assets um without having a central body in the middle necessarily to to be able to then exchange those assets whatever they may be whether that's a um you know a, a coin or, or or a tokenization of something um so i think the digital ledger where we see currencies we see smart contracts we see tokenization of other assets like um real estate or or or, or art or wine or something um i think di- the digital ledger i think lots of people are investing in it um and the actors, obviously, in that space of big technology firms like the IBMs of this world, or um, also big banks, big technology firms, but also governments are in there uh, as well. So if you look at what's happening in, in China or, 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 or European banks. So um, it, it's, it's, un, it's unclear to me when we talk about digital ledger technology, I think the, the applications of that are many. And I think there's a lot of benefits to people across the globe um, and being able to work with, you know, big techs or, or banks or to, to be able to enable that, I think is, is everyone is, is, is looking at it. But everyone's been looking at it for 10 years as well. Um, and and um, so, so I, think, I, think that, I think the DLT, I think, is the important piece for me. Cryptocurrencies as a, as a topic, obviously, We've seen what happened last year when, you know, actors in that space are not fully regulated or not governed in the way that other yeah. companies are. We saw billions being lost by customers. Um, and I think that comes back to, I think we'll see more regulation in this space over time. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, some of the things that are coming out in the press is, is quite, quite in, interesting. Um, especially for someone who works in a bank that's heavily regulated, how <laughs> billions can be lost in that space yeah, is yeah. Quite, quite extraordinary. So I think there's a few things. I think the, the digital technology itself, the, the, the DLT, the, the cryptocurrency as a, as a wider topic, um, whether that will be underpinned in the same as, as, a, as a proper currency uh, by government uh, and central banks, or, or whether we'll be allowed to just continue to create these uh, these speculative currencies, which really have no underpinning to value. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that that works. But I can I can definitely see a world where governments are involved, banks are involved. There's a currency that's underpinned by in the same way as our current currency. It's almost just a digital version of it, and that is transferred through some sort of ledger system in a more streamlined way than we have today. Can I see that in the future? Yes. Um, but, you know, I'm not a big buyer into these speculative cryptocurrencies, which, you know, seem to go up 10% one day and 10% down 10% another. Yeah, yeah. And my question was really targeted towards that future um, uh, that you mentioned, uh, because I also mm. think that, um, it would probably become more regulated, and therefore the banks would get involved. Therefore, the the governments, as you say, will will, will get involved. But you would still need the big techs to manage because the technology is advancing so fast. Um, yeah. And also, someone needs to manage the data, right? It it mm. can just sit yes anywhere, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm. It, it it has to. So so I, I think this ecosystem um, configuration of who does what. And how value is created 
for the different parties, but more importantly, for the customer? How do you create a higher valued customer experience would come down to, I, I, would, I would think, you know, tighter regulation, more compliance, more secure, and more security in handling the data um, uh, and so on, right? I mean, we don't want to end up in a situation uh, as we see in Asia, where you have these companies becoming super apps, uh, just entering pretty much every, everything and everyone, right? Like Alipay, WeChat, WePay, C, Bcash, you know, only, I mean, these super apps, it's no wonder we don't see them in Europe or, or, you know, in the US or in other more regulated markets, right? Because you can see what's happening there, even though the, the story of unfinancial and how it was killed by the Chinese government is also interesting, right? A few years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's true. But I think that tight, tight, but more coupled view of regulation, I think the, the, the involvement of the government, the banks, and like you say, big techs, especially on data, and, and, and especially around the cloud, the, the security around some of the things that uh, the likes of Microsoft and other providers are at. Um, but the, the security around encryption um and the, and the and the state of the art investments that they're making in their data centers is it's really quite extraordinary uh, so people will start, uh, you know link cloud as being unsecure in some way because people have put pictures and they haven't secured it very well with a uh on, on a cloud and they haven't got a very good password but the financial data that's going into cloud um is fully encrypted yeah. you know it's it's state of the art technology and, and, you know, banks are coupling with um, providers like Microsoft or Amazon and Google to, to really secure that data in a, in a, in a, in a completely uh, new and far more advanced way than, than people could even imagine. So absolutely, I think big techs have a big play, um, banks have a key play, but I do think governments and regulation will come in to make sure that it's something that people really trust in. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I speak to people, you know, inside and outside of banking and, and they have different views on crypto. Uh, one is it's a speculative tool. They bought it at nine, 9,000. They want it to go to uh, 200,000, but there's no intrinsic value. And some people believe that the, the technology really, a way of trans, you know, transferring value whether it's a tokenized asset or whether it's a uh, currency seems seems to have something that is the future um but it has to be coupled i think with big tech all the way through to government uh, and regulation i think that's the only way that we'll really have something secure and less fluctuations so you can actually purchase something and not be worried about the the currency the following day yeah so we come back to this issue of trust again right so you you right you need mm. to build trust with your customers with the end user right otherwise all the all of these new technologies and all of these new business models um uh, fall apart especially in the light of these scandals that are coming out right i mean as you said you know just you know the thought of losing trillions um in a matter of hours or in a matter of days it's just it's just unbelievable but just just before we move away from cryptocurrencies, I want to maybe um, uh, focus a little bit on NFTs. What is your thought on NFTs? I mean, they they've been um, coming out uh, initially as you know uh, pieces of art, digital art, but now you you see them everywhere. They have gained a lot of traction in marketing, but also ways of building uh, investments that are constantly evolving right you can add things to them uh as you're going along and and i wonder how in in bank uh, in the banking space in in financial services how is how are nfts uh being seen you know wh whether that's something that banks are interested in or not really it's it's, it's another type of asset it's another type so. of I, 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 th I think that's it. I think, I think it's a tokenized item, right? It's obviously got a global reach. It's great for marketing. There's lots of speculation there. Um, it's a way of, 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 of splitting down these, these assets. But to be honest, it's just another, it's just another asset. Um, well, that's how, that's how, <laughs> um, so again, it's not a banked view, you know, all of these views, my views, but I just see it as another, another asset. And, and the, just the concern 
comes back to that trust around speculation. Uh, so, you know, we saw a huge corrections in the in, in some of those markets. And, and, you know, whenever you get that, there's obviously been winners and losers in that. Um, uh, so, yeah, I just see it as an asset that's been tokenized. To be honest. Okay. So um, I'm just going to use the last few minutes uh, of our talk just to focus on this idea of, um, you know, building um, digital maturity and using that digital maturity to develop a higher valued customer experience. Wh what are your priorities? How, how, you know, what are the key digital capabilities that you need to have for your organization to do all the things that we've talked about, right? So build a higher valued customer experience, secure the data uh, that would allow you to generate value. Um, but also build this knowledge exchange and innovation with the partnerships um, with fintech and big tech that we've talked about. What are, what are your key priorities? Yeah, so um, so if you, if you break it, obviously we're talking about maturity of technology, but I think it's also maturity of the relationship with the clients, and I'll talk about both. Because I think the technology itself isn't revolutionary. I think it's the it, it's the knowledge, the deep understanding of our client requirements, which is and coupled with the technology, I think is the interesting bit. So, you know, all firms are doing the same thing, right? So um, we're, we're implementing agile principles um, around how we deliver to market the velocity of our change and what we're spending um, our, our money on. Um, those agile principles enabling us to really react quicker to our customers' needs. Cloud is a big one. Um, we've obviously got big, um, we talked about cloud just around, you know, partnering with those big techs who are, you know, state of the art uh, abilities around creating that elastic demand whenever we need it, securing the data. Um, also, I think microservices on top, enabling us to tap into that, th those knowledges without having to build those microservices within the cloud. So cloud technology is obviously key to us. Connected, obviously, to connected to the cloud is the data. Um, you know, being able to organize, have the lineage, the regulatory requirements around data. Connected to data and the cloud is AI, uh, our ability to farm the data and get insights where we can then tailor uh, products to our clients' needs um, in a better way than, than we have uh, be before. Looking at digital assets, but more less on the crypto side, but more on the digital ledger, um, what we can do to to help uh, understand what the future would be and, and uh, around those digital assets. Um, also, partnering with fintechs, uh, all, all of all of those things um, we are heavily investing in to make sure. But it's coupled. It's not just investing in AI for the sake of it, cloud for the sake of it, or data for the sake of it. It's really coupling our real deep understanding of our client, uh, our deep relationship with our client to make sure that we are delivering in a very agile way their, their requirements. And where, where people have in the past maybe have gone to a fintech, well, let's understand why and, and are we meeting those, or can we meet those requirements in a better way, uh, in a more holistic way uh, for, for our clients? So, yeah, there's a technology maturity. Some of these technologies like blockchain and, uh, uh, and and the like are constantly maturing it's it's it, it was overhyped years ago and but over the next five years we'll see a lot more applications for that within within uh, the ecosystems that we are uh, we're building so yes we are maturing those we are implementing um, against them but it's coupled with the really strong long deep understanding of the relationship with our clients Okay. And in building those partnerships with uh, big tech, especially mm. the cloud uh, based ones, right? Um, mm. I think in a previous conversation we had uh, uh, back in uh, uh, at the Shard, I think it was mm. a few months ago, um, mm. you mentioned that it is important to manage the contract um, mm. with the cloud providers in order to ensure that your data is not leaking into other types of services, but also has the 
you know, the level of security that you require and the level of encryption that you require and you expect to deliver a higher value, uh, a customer value, right? So what are, what are some of the just high level, um, what are some of the key points that you um, are very careful with in building these types of partnerships with cloud providers? What are you looking for and what are you expecting to see um, from those relationships? Sure. And, and so I think, I think it's beyond cloud, but, it, but I think the general point is, I think working in banks for 20 years, I think there's been a, a, a maturing of our ability to get the most out of those third party relationships. We, we always will connect with third parties outside of the bank for providing services better than we can do internally. I think going back 20 years, I've seen banks who have been really bad at outsourcing problems. Um, so you've got a problem internally and you throw it over the wall, expecting everything to just be fixed. And, um, and, and, and that didn't turn out well. Um, and, and it can be a very expensive uh, lesson. Uh, even though third parties often shake their, you know, nod their head and say, yes, they'll sort it. They're also saying, thank you very much, because this is going to be a very lucrative um, work for them, because uh, sorting out that problem can, can often cost a lot of money. So, so often we, we have to really have a deep understanding of what we're trying to achieve, a deep understanding of the relationship that we want. And what services are we really buying in a better way than we can deliver internally? And I think if we can, if we can work that through that with a, with a world-class vendor who can genuinely provide services in a better way, because they're investing more than we could ever do. They are investing in, in they understand security and um, data. The, the good thing about some of these big techs, they've had years and years of building up their understanding of data um, with, with their existing clients. And they're kind of transposing that uh, knowledge and, and transporting it and, and creating value for themselves. If you look at some of their results, a large chunk of it is now in the cloud because they learned for years on their own data uh, and they're now selling that to, to other people. So I think the maturity is all about really understanding it, not throwing over a problem, more about buying in a service that is better than we can do internally and working with the third parties to make sure that the, the it's uh, it delivers everything that we need in a very secure way. Okay, and and the final point is um, not one that we have discussed uh, in a great extent, but um, it goes without saying that um, leadership is important, right? Mm. And leaders will have to make some very difficult decisions in dealing with some of the things that. You mentioned right including legacy systems including te technical debt but also on the human side you know you mentioned culture for example early on in our talk and the ability to build um skills human skills that uh, train your 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 employees um your staff to be able to understand and use the the types of technology that uh you're bringing forward can you talk a little bit about the human side of mature, digital maturity um, and, and, and how you as a, as a chief executive in your organization are, are handling that. Yeah, so I think, um, I think on the leadership side, um, I've seen huge changes. Um, I've seen where um, the chief digital information office, officer that I work with is now on, on the board uh, or, or the executive committee where Previously, it was down in the organization. We saw um, previous CIO, CIOs I've worked with were, were down in the organization, but they were looking after digital. So it was almost the business was looking after itself and we needed stuff to be done by tech. Now I see a, a maturity of really technology can be a differentiator, both for the product delivering to the client and, and that rise in the organization, both from a level but also from a, an understanding and what it can deliver, it, it definitely see. I see, I see technology decisions really at the at the senior levels of the organisation now. Ownership of the digital roadmaps, where we're going, um, what we should invest in, um, 
when it was down in the organization um, to to really being part of how you know executive committees work um, that is that has matured over recent years um, quite accelerated actually and so I, I see now the senior leaders having to really understand in detail uh, technology as well as their business strategies and how how technology can enable that so you know five ten years ago it is very very different now certainly what I see um, in terms of the the, the knowledge and also the, the the level of discussions in the organization uh, around technology and what technology can do. So I've seen a huge swathe of maturity, and I, I guess that will continue, um, but it is completely different than it was five years ago. And, and I guess this is organic in a way, mm -hmm. uh, learning, as, uh, learning by doing, essentially, but also potentially bringing in um, new people with new skills uh, so it's it's both organic, bottom up, and and top down in a way. Um, and how how does that how do those leadership changes um, uh, manifest in the rest of the organization in relation to building digital units, uh, building digital training camps, and 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 so on and so forth? How 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 do you do that in uh, maybe you can yeah. use an example from UBS. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the organization. It really has to be led from the top. And the, and the whole organization, certainly around change, has been reorganized itself um, into, into um, you know, things like streams, crews, uh, pods uh, of, of, of people who, where we had the business people and technology people working differently. Now we have them working together in the same teams. Um, where we had handoffs from one team to another, uh, now they're working on the same same ideas and, and 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 rapid development. Where we had waterfall ways of working, now it's it's more iterative. You know, minimum buy a product, get it out there, completely um, uh, change it. So the organisation of, of and how it's constructing itself and how it's working from again five years ago to how it is now is 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 completely different. And, and the ability for the organization to work together <coughs> more seamlessly has really been led from the top. Um, that kind of organization and cultural change around technology and the business working, meeting the client's needs in a more rapid way than we've done before can only be led from the top for me. And uh, we have now a set of leadership, you know, my, my boss the, um, is on, the, on the CDIO side, um, you know, he's really driven huge swathes of cultural change in, in that way. And, and so it's not just being a thought, it's actually turned out to be organizationally. How we set yeah. ourselves up um, uh, is connected to what, we've, what we want to achieve around the technology and, and our client's needs. We are now organized in a way that delivers uh, in, that, in that way, both from a business and technology uh, join, joined up delivery. Fantastic. Derek, thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. Thank you for your time. No problem at all. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.